infrastructure it's built on is dependable. But with so many information technologies coming together on the internet, cracks can appear in the system. Beneath the apparent stability of the World Wide Web lies a vast wired network that can be surprisingly fragile. Telecommunications is pervasive. You, you really don't have any idea what you don't see. And in fact, if you look at every window in this building, there's probably a computer, if not two, behind every window. That computer goes into a network on every floor. Every floor goes into a larger network on every building. The buildings all connect to networks under the streets. And these networks feed into larger networks again that ring the city. And the city networks connect into rings that go across our country, throughout North America, and right across the oceans. Everything uses fundamentally the same networks. Sharing the same networks brings risks. January 2008. Internet services throughout the Middle East and Southern Asia are suddenly crippled. India loses 60% of its internet access. 70% of Egypt's network goes down. Uh, the various agencies in charge of the telecommunication service provision in Egypt have been taking bold steps uh, to handle the crisis so that Egypt remains online and connected to the rest of the world. The disruption is caused when four undersea telecommunication cables are severed within three days. One of them, 12,000 miles long and one inch thick, stretches from France through the Mediterranean and Red Seas, then around India to Singapore. So all the ships arriving to repair the two cables will arrive uh, 10 kilometers in the Mediterranean north from Alexandria and uh, uh, provide us with the necessary information about the real reason uh, uh, for the cuts. The cause of the cut cables was never determined. Suspicions fell on ship's anchors or fishing gear dragging along the seabed, or terrorists trying to bring down the internet. Nevertheless, after a temporary slowdown, internet traffic was rerouted through other channels. Submarine cables carry the bulk of data and voice traffic between continents. Today's wired world is the result of 150 years of stringing cable, starting when the first undersea telegraph line connected the United Kingdom to Nova Scotia. Now, one and a half million kilometers of wire crisscrosses the oceans, stringing a communications net around the world, and the cables are damaged frequently. Here in Dorset, on the south coast of Britain, Global Marine repairs undersea fiber optic cables for companies around the world. There's enough stored here to circle the planet one and a half times. Finding the broken ends at the bottom of the ocean isn't easy. Once they're brought to the surface, each side of the severed cable must be replaced and tested. But the really tough bit is reattaching the tiny strands of optical fiber one by one. Probably takes a couple of days uh, on board ship to, to join up, depending on how many fibers there are in the cable. It's painstaking work, like brain surgery on a sea monster. But most of the information flowing around the world moves through cables just like these where we have rings within rings within rings spanning the earth with fiber optic cable. And its capacity is theoretically almost unlimited. We keep increasing the speed on it. Old-fashioned copper cable is bulky and slow. This one multi-strand line can service 2,400 customers. Yet a single strand of optical fiber can do the work of 100 thick copper cables. Combine 72 fibers in one fiber optic cable and you can connect 18 million people to communicate at the speed of light. Yet with single lines of optical fiber now carrying so much of our telecommunications, 
the system itself faces new risks. Although the Egyptian incident drew attention to the vulnerability of undersea cables, it also demonstrated the resilience of the global fiber optic network. There's a cut in a cable going across the Pacific and traffic needed to get from uh, Vancouver to Tokyo. It's entirely possible that that information will just go around the world in the other direction, mixing with mingling with phone calls and email messages and television signals from Amsterdam and Minsk and Delhi, Singapore, and then finally get to Tokyo via that route. Our entire telecommunication system is steadily converging onto that network. Until recently, connections to different systems were separate. Electricity, phone, television, internet. Each followed a different pathway. Today, they're all meshing into one complex interactive network. Well, now, you're going to have, in many cases, a single wire. And the single wire will be doing many more things. Uh, this wire will be carrying information for your home telephone system. It will be bringing your television signals in, uh, probably on demand as well. It's certainly going to be your internet access pipe. Uh, it could be used for the maintenance and uh, monitoring of your appliances, of your electricity consumption, uh, your burglar alarm system, and different applications that contribute to your lifestyle and support your lifestyle, all coming in through a single wire. The many separate telecommunications channels are fusing into a unified network, like the nerves in our body converging along the spine. The advantages of having all these services on a, on a single uniform pipe is that they're all using a common technology, which makes the integration and the application of the technology more affordable, more widespread, uh, and it really contributes to driving down the overall costs of modern lifestyle we all enjoy. But typically with complex systems, every efficiency has a downside. We make a lot of assumptions about the availability, the re robustness, the resilience of that one pipe. And the overall requirement for security associated with that pipe um, is increased. So you face uh, a larger risk, not so much because the system itself is more risky, but because you've aggregated and you put your eggs into one basket. Designing telecommunications networks that can withstand accidental system crashes and deliberate attacks is one of the goals at Advanced Technologies Laboratory. What we're looking at here is the biggest telecom concentrator in the world. Uh, it's equivalent to hundreds of millions of uh, uh, conversations uh, at the same time. And with that much data streaming through a single switching center, what happens when there's a system failure? Automatically, this emergency system take, takes over in one twentieth of a second. As a matter of fact, it takes four failures to break this machine at the same time. But some of our biggest, most vital systems have few such backups. And the mechanisms that control them are being unified as well. Everything from power plants to water supplies is now being managed by a single, sophisticated kind of software. This brain at the center of most of our critical infrastructure is called SCADA. It stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. SCADA enables us to automate bigger and more complex systems and to manage them more efficiently. Any big distributed infrastructure uh, that you can think of that's critical to the way we live our life is controlled by a SCADA system. Transmission towers, nuclear reactors, power grids, and oil pipelines couldn't function without SCADA. It talks to the machines and feeds back crucial information. In many large cities, SCADA controls the water system, reservoir levels, chlorination, and wastewater all monitored at a control center by its SCADA system. The problem with the SCADA system and the blessing of the SCADA system is it is the keys to, to the kingdom. Control. It controls everything that is running in the particular system it manages. You know, so it's like the symphony conductor. And so if you take the conductor away, or if you uh, put a gun to the conductor's head and say, do it differently, you've really got control of the whole symphony and you can make it play whatever you want. 
the skate assist.